presented uh, by Professor Harry Drickmer, who is a very special guest. And uh, if you didn't know this, he was the professor under whom John studied to get his PhD. Thank you, Professor Drickmer, for being here today. Functional pressure. 
Uh, we see in the first kilobar an increase, which is about by free tryptophan. Then there's an S-shaped curve, which is typical when you have equilibrium between two uh, conformations, uh, in this case, an unfolded and folded native and a denatured protein. And this uh, comes down at levels of around 8 kilobars. Then there's a second one, which we can argue is now in the second problem. The protein un unfolding and exposing the tryptophan to water. Now, if we assume that these represent equilibrium and say globulin 1 and globulin 2, then we can calculate an equilibrium constant as a function of pressure, and from the pressure of the equilibrium constant, we get the changes in partial molar volume. And in this case, it's minus 20 cc's per mole, and here it's minus 40 cc's per mole. In either case, small compared to the volume of the molecule, we like to weigh 15,000. Now, uh, tryptophan as an enzyme has the following function. It grabs a glucose in here and chews it up. And this it does very effectively in a matter of seconds. Now, uh, so that we can, uh, uh, we, we can follow this. But if we now substitute a, a glycosamine for glucose with an NH2 group in it, it'll grab out of it quite reluctantly. And it takes several days to chew it up. And our experiments last several hours so that we can study uh, the emission and the presence of the glucosamine. And we see we get quite a different curve. Now I should mention that both of these things are completely reversible. Uh, when you take off the pressure at about 90% back and another hour at 100% back, it's of interest that it takes 12 to 24 hours to restore all the biological activity, meaning there's some emotion we don't pick up at this point. So now, how, how to describe this? Well, we can write equations for the equilibrium constant in region 1, region 2, globule 1, globule 2. These represent the equilibrium of the pure lysozyme. Uh, P1 half is the pressure where k equals 1, and logarithm k equals 0. And uh, delta G1 and delta G2 are the difference in free energy between the unfolded, the folded protein uh, uh, attaching to the glucosamine in region 1 and in region 2. Now we can make several assumptions about these delta Gs and see what uh, uh, sort of information they give us. If we assume delta G1 and delta G2 are both zero, we just think people can get with uh, pure lysozyme. If on the other hand we assume that delta G1 is zero and delta G2 is minus 5RT compared to uh, the, uh, the uh, unfolded protein, uh, then we can reproduce quite well what we see with the lysozyme. What this means is that with pressure, we've created a modified protein, which is a better uh, enzyme to destroy the, the glucosamine than the original. So in a sense, this is a way of creating a new catalyst. Not a very effective way to get even a graduate student at 8 kilobytes or so. <laughs> 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 not so effective. But in any case, this shows you the kind of information now, I'll say just a word or two about what we see with the uh, uh, external probe, the, uh, the liquid. This shows uh, the amyloneptic sulfate, which is one of a dozen we could do out of it. And we see it thrust it very poorly when it's in solution. But when it attaches under organic substrate, the luminescence takes off. This is to see a very large scale. And now, of course, in how many places are we attaching it? Well, we can tell that. By plotting. Two sides of the pressure. 
So this then to give you some notion of the kinds of information you find out and how you can now understand better the behavior of proteins uh, under various circumstances. And this work has been extended by these other people to uh, viruses, DNA, uh, things of that kind. So that there's a, 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 an enormous amount of information now concerning pressure effects and how they tell us more about uh, protein conformation and protein folding. All right. So now I'll turn to the second problem. The second problem is uh, much more recent in its origin. origin. In the last uh, two or three years ago, I had a postdoc at Jam and Lyon, and by then we had abandoned our liquid rate for a 12, 13 years or so. But he wanted to learn about the liquid rate, so I set up an experiment that he could do to regenerate the rate we went at. And this will have to do with the isomerization of molecules. The molecule is dimethyl benzyl benzyl nitrile, and it's a planar molecule, and it has an excited state which is also planar, but then there's another excited state in which the uh, dimethyl amino group twists, and it, with that twist there's also an electron transfer. So that uh, this then has quite a different electronic structure when this is twisted, and both of these have emissions. Uh, the planar uh, excited state emits around 27,000 wave numbers in the near UV, and uh, the uh, twisted form uh, that's around 20,000, so they're uh, 30 separate. Now, by various means, we don't have to go into here. We can establish the relative amount of efficiencies in the two, so we can use the areas under the peak as a measure of the relative amounts of the two that we have. And these are, oh, I should say we studied these in, uh, in a number of the solvents, ethanol, normal butanol, normal pentanol. There should be some very useful for ethanol. But we, <laughs> And isobutanol and glycerol. Now it turns out that the glycerol data uh, are really not relevant to our discussion, but we're we'll up here from time to time on the transparencies. This shows typical atmospheric pressure data. This is in ethanol, where almost all of the yield is the twisted form, very large yield. And there in glycerol is almost equal amounts of the two, just to show you the kind of <coughs> data that we get. And again, to show you the data as a function of pressure, we start out uh, with normal butanol, again, with almost everything in the twisted form. And as we increase the pressure, uh, first here, then here, then here, we increase more and more of, of, of the plane form. So that's a process. Now, how to describe this process? Well, first place, uh, to show you qualitatively, kinds of effect. You can see that we make big changes. These are large scales. And we change the relative amounts by something like an order of magnitude of the pressure. Now, what, is, what sort of kinetics are we talking about here? Well, we have enough for, uh, rate constants to satisfy any analysis. We start out with the excitation. We now have the uh, gradient of the non rated emission from the uh, planar molecule, we have the rate of formation of the twisted molecule, the rate of formation back to this, and the rate of a, uh, rate of a non rate of emission from the second molecule. So we got six rate constants. And I say, that should satisfy any analysis. I gave him a show. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so now uh, we can write the equation which represents uh, this, uh, this equation, we've got all these great constants in here. I defined them already, we need to go through it again. Now, we've got two possible limitations. Supposing uh, the rate of isomerization is fast compared with the fluorescent processes. The fluorescent processes are in nanosecond range. Then, uh, you see, we can drop out these rates, and we'll have just the ratio of the forward and the back of the rate constant. In other words, a chemical equilibrium process. Supposing, however, that the rate constants for the chemistry are slow compared to the fluorescence rate constants, then it turns out that we can neglect this KD in the denominator, and we end up with a kinetic problem. Now, which is true? Well, if we uh, are, are in an equilibrium problem, we should get the largest yield uh, for methanol, or for ethanol, excuse me. Uh, and, uh, uh, if, if, but it turns out we get the smallest yield for ethanol, so we're getting into a kinetics problem. Excuse this next with the transparency. The original disappeared last Friday, and this is an attempt to multiply uh, it from the uh, uh, from the thing in the paper, right? But, but the main thing I would point out is this is the uh, <coughs> this is the thing which governs the amount of the twisted form we should get, and we 
we see that if we live out the glycerol, the largest is for ethanol, but the yield is smallest. So that we must be dealing with replacement power. We're not dealing with a problem in equilibrium. So now our, our equation simplifies somewhat. We can write now the ratio of the intensities in terms of uh, luminescence constant plus Ka as Kd dropped out compared to the other. Now, there are good reasons why the luminescence constants are independent of pressure. We know that the fluorescence rate and the rate of the rate doesn't change with pressure between this. In this case, the peaks shift very little, so that the non rate of rate is not going to change much with pressure. So we can simplify this into the form uh, of a constant times of Ka. Now, Ka we can formulate the following way. This is shorthand for just the I ray rates in k volts per T over H times e to the minus delta G of activation over RT. And this is the viscosity taken at some power alpha. Now again, if alpha is approaching one, then we've got essentially a barrier this process and we're limited entirely by the motion of the molecules in solution. And if alpha approaches zero, then we've got just the iron equation, single configuration coordinate problem. Now, what in fact is true? Well, first of all, look at the three linear alpha. Here we see, plotted against viscosity, the equation of viscosity data, the uh, ratio of the peaks. And we see in the first place we get straight lines. They're approximately parallel. And a slope of 0.5, meaning that neither uh, the limit is here, is the, the, both uh, the viscosity and the uh, uh, kinetics are important. And this is uh, true in quite a number of cases, I understand. Now, uh, here we get these straight slopes. And uh, so everything seems to be hungry door. But now, okay, again, at this ugly transparency, I want to compare ISO and neurobutanol. You see they have the same polarity constants. They have the same densities. They actually have the same compressibilities. They have the same peak location. Everything's identical. So normal isobutanol, according to this kind of argument, should fall on top of each other. What do we actually see? Well, this is the normal butanol data from the previous slide, and this is isobutanol. In the first place, this deviation is uh, one and a half to two, which is outside of experimental error. In the second place, the isobutanol data, in contrast to the other, is about a very strong curvature. The fact that the butanol, that the crystal data attaches on, is really a coincidence because there's just so many changing properties of the, uh, the crystal that they cancel out. It's this difference that's important. Now, what sort of a question does this raise in our minds? Well, uh, many of us over the years have used plots of bulk properties versus molecular properties to, uh, to predict uh, the local properties and the function of the bulk properties. I strongly advocate the use of pressure to vary the bulk properties because you don't uh, and then have so, much, so many changes in composition and geometry and things of that kind. And these correlations by large are all right. But now you have to ask yourself some questions. Uh, we know what the viscosity of a liquid is, but what is the resistance to shear of a solid molecule immediately adjacent to a solid molecule? Is it the same or is it different? What is the density uh, of the liquid immediately around the solid, solid molecule compared to the bulk density? What is the compressibility? And what is the reaction to an electric field compared to the dielectric constant? Now, and particularly this is important in uh, highly polar solids where you solvate the molecule and the, sol the local molecules have reduced their ability to move. So, uh, the, the, these I think are important questions and questions which have not been answered. Now, I think in most cases they're second order. We know that most of these correlations work quite well. We know things like Lanzager's theory of a cavity around a, a solute molecule is reasonably good. Uh, uh, Rudy theory of electron transfer works quite well. And uh, the, both of these assume that the local dielectric constant is the same as the bulk dielectric constant. But I think these second order effects can be important. And what you shouldn't do is push too far and too long on the, uh, uh, these correlations, which give you a good semi-quantitative or qualitative effect, but not to use them as a, as a gospel for 
extrapolation and things of that sort. Okay, well, that gives you a sort of a picture of the kinds of things we've done with liquids, and I hope that, well, it is not in the mainstream of this thing, there's enough overlap between the interests that at least it conveys some information from news to you. Thank you. Do I have any uh, questions? This paper is open for questions at this time. Is how does a protein fold? How does it fold? Is this a tool that's being used now that, oh, to yeah, understand? Yeah, well, actually, this tool is being used, and actually, it was pretty. Jerry Douglas said, oh, no, I that we get to carbon 13 and NMR, we take to NMR to study protein. We get much more detailed information. So, yeah, the people are doing this all the time. Well, what is the distance, roughly, that the unfolding takes place? What order of magnitude in something like because it, it's reversible, it comes back. Yeah, and a lot of denaturations uh, don't go back, they're not reversible. Okay, so it's, a, it's, it's, it's relatively small. Yeah, I mean, minus maybe 10. Uh, 10 extra percent. So I don't, I think we're not talking about millimeters, uh, right? Okay. But uh, uh, the, this folding problem is, uh, and, uh, and this is one of the arguments of the fact of folding problem, the change in the pressure that is reversible. Right. And all the other changes are. Okay, thank you. Um, are there any other uh, questions for Professor Gerkemer? If they're not, I think what we probably should do, I, I have a